So if you saw me at all yesterday, um, you know that the way I like to start out is to um, A, say thank you for being here, and, and B, to tell you that when you leave from talking with me, you're going to have more questions than answers, because I don't have the answers. Um, any wisdom that you need about what we're talking about is in this room already. It's lovely to be invited, isn't it, Kathy? It's lovely to be invited and talk and, 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 and learn things yourselves. But um, anything that you all need to know is right here. So I always start out with this quote. And if you were with me yesterday, you heard it already. So you can, re you can, you can repeat it with me. So here's what I think. The purpose of art is to lay bare the questions that have been hidden by the answers, which is James Baldwin. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, I know that the title that I'm to talk about is Coming Together Through the Arts. So to start out with this slide might seem a little, little uh, counterintuitive. Because this is a slide of um, some artists that I know uh, who I admire greatly uh, taking a mirrored casket through the streets of Ferguson during the uprising after Mike Brown was murdered. And this is one of the purposes of art, is to do this, to use your talents to do this. Um, so I believe that this is actually, while this was something that tore our community apart in one way, it also brought us together. It, um, un it ripped the Band-Aid off everything that we knew was going on, and no one could ignore it anymore. The brilliance of the mirrored casket is that, of course, you can see the reflection of the people they were standing in front of. And we can see our own reflections in that casket. This casket has actually, would you do the next slide? Thank you. The casket has actually gone on to the African American Museum of Art and History in Washington, DC. Um, it's more of an artifact than a piece of art, but I think it's a piece of art. Um, one of the reasons, and if we can go back to them, <laughs> if one of the reasons that um, these artists were on the front line is that they already knew each other. They had already come together as a group of people. Uh, one of the privileges that I had when I was at the Regional Arts Commission for 14 years was to run something that we called the Community Arts Training Institute the Cat Institute, and if you meet people from St. Louis and they say they're cats, that's what they mean. And the puns are never ending, I promise you. If you were a new cat, you were a kitty. Um, so, and we call each other cats. Oh, he's a cat. <laughs> we know what that means. Um, and, but I, I don't want to make it sound insider, because what it means is that there were, there's a group of about 390 people now who have gone to the Community Arts Training Institute in St. Louis. And this institute, is a cross-sector institute. And by that, I mean every cohort was eight artists of all disciplines and eight people who were identified as community activists, community organizers, teachers, um, social workers, politicians, and they trained together for five months. So these 16 people became a cohort and discussed what it meant to be creative together to be creative within communities, and to understand that when art is part of a community, that you are working with a community, you're not doing something for them. So this is a group of people who shared a base of language. And we were very, very, very intentional about keeping these cohorts connected to the other cohorts. So all those 16 people were connected to the next 16 people and the 16 people before them. We did something called the cat cafes way before there were cat cafes with real cats in them. Um, so when this uprising happened and it tore the Band-Aid off, these folks knew who to call because they knew each other. And when you think about it, so you're here and you have your group of people and you're the pebble in the pond and there is a ripple around you. And that ripple hits the ripples of the other pebble in the pond and creates a web of people that come together. 
So I'm not so much talking about the art making itself, but the people who make the art and why they make it. And I think that that's a really important thing to think about. As artists, as people who work within communities, as people who collect art, who know artists, who are in an arts community. And I think it's really important to talk about being a community. And that if you don't know other people, you should be knowing other people. That art is no longer just about being in your studio by yourself. It just isn't. Because we don't live in those times anymore. So I think that, um, that, that looking at the mirror casket is, is, a, is a really way, wonderful way of talking about this. The things that we are learning about community and about where the arts fit into that community is that everything is time and relationship based. If you're working within community, if you're an artist like Dan, Dan talked about this in his talk, um, that it's time and relationship based. That everything we do is based on relationships. And that you, what your job is, is to, to make those relationships. Your job is to be the, a creative person who recognizes the creativity in someone else. And able to pull that creativity forward. To join your own. So that there's, there's a togetherness and that there's an organization and, and there's a feeling of we are a community. Um, hold on a second, let me, what's my next slide? Um, th this is actually a project by Dee Nichols, who some of you might know because Dee is a St. Louis artist, but I know she spent some time in Memphis. Um, she did, this is, <laughs> we made some comment about post-it notes the other day about, you know, there's all these post-it notes and we never know what happens to them after a workshop, right? So Dee decided to use the post-it notes as her art. And um, she, as you can see, what she says is everything changed, and in fact it did. Um, all over St. Louis, in every institution, for better or for worse sometimes, we were working with this notion of what it meant to have a community come up, be torn apart, and also to be together at the same time, which sounds like it's not the same thing, but it is. So artists were talking, even artists who weren't used to talking about what was happening in our community. And I think this, is, this was a great lesson for all of us because people were so hungry to be able to talk about something. If you read the news, Ferguson, of course, made, made national news, international news, and none of it was real. What they told you was not the truth. They did not show you this part. They did not show you the conversations that art was making in the streets. They did not show you how, while we were arguing and, and, and there was discord, there was also the coming together. And art was such a, such a big part of that. And I think that that was a real lesson for our, our entire community, not just our arts community, about what art meant and how it was important. So those are the, thing, the kinds of things that we learned and are continuing to learn. Um, I talked yesterday, and I'm going to talk again, so if you heard me yesterday, I'm sorry to repeat myself, but I think it's important to talk about it. Um, we, we really find that when artists are working within community, um, and it's something we talk about in the CAD Institute a lot, it's about the notion of transformation. Um, when you're working with a group of people, whether it's a people in a neighborhood or a people in a social service agency, or however you're working, there's a personal transformation that happens with the people you're working with. You can't write poetry and not be changed. You can't paint a ba basketball court with a group of people and not be changed. You can't. You can't perform Shakespeare in the streets and not be changed. So there's a personal transformation that happens. Um, I like to use um, a program that a friend of mine started who was also uh, alumni of the Cat Institute. She and the shelter manager, who was an alumni of the Cat Institute, started, gosh, almost, I think it's 15 years ago, um, a program at um, a homeless shelter for men in transition. This meant that these men were given a place to stay and were helping to get jobs because they had made some decisions about their lives, about not wanting to be on the streets anymore. So that's what they meant about transition. But basically, these were people who were homeless. So they started this program, and they started writing poetry. They started 
painting murals. They started doing all these things. And, and, and even when the men graduated from the transition program, they would come back on the Thursday nights that the art happened because it was so important to their lives. So, so they were having a personal transformation. Then there's something that happens that I don't think anybody ever expects. The transformation of the organization or the group that you're working with, right? There's individual transformation and then there's a group transformation. The agency, which was Peter and Paul Community Services where this transitional housing was happening, they were blown away by what was happening. Um, they, they, they didn't understand why this was so powerful. Because of course they did it, oh isn't that nice, you know, Con and Tom are gonna do this nice little arts program with these guys and you know, it'll give them something to do. That's not at all what happened. So Tom, who is the shelter manager, said, you know, I sit down and I make the art, you know, he's the shelter manager, not the artist, right? And I make the art with my men and we succeed and fail together, and we succeed and fail together making this art. And I learned so much more about them than I would ever learn from any kind of counseling session. And they learn about me too. And he said, you know, I don't have to nag them. We can have real conversations. We can come together. And so the way that they designed the program changed because they had art as part of that program. And then, of course, Peter and Paul started using the art in all of their brochures and all of their, the way they talked about what they did because they became very proud of what happened. And one of the things the men did was they created a number of performance pieces. Um, and these were incredibly um, moving performance pieces. It was from their writing. The men would perform maybe not the writing that they wrote, but the writing from the collective and they created a theater piece from it. And I've seen this, I don't know, at least a dozen times, this, this particular performance, so they've done many others. And it's moving every time. It's moving because they bring you into their world. I know what a monkey trail is. I know what it means to fly a sign. And I can't walk by or drive by a man or a woman or a child, because now there are children on the street, without looking them in the eye and treating them as human and not just seeing them as a group called homeless. And that's the community change. If I learned that, the other people who were at that performance have learned that too. I always tell the story about one of the performances at a church. The men did it and somebody, you know, the men afterwards will do um, a question and answer and they're very generous with their time. Um, and very honest, and somebody raised their hand and said, I'm sorry, I'm really confused. I thought you told us that this was a performance by homeless men. And the guys looked at each other and just started laughing. And one of the guys said, well, we're sorry, we forgot to wear our homeless costumes. Because this person in the audience couldn't believe that these per people standing in front of them were in a transition program, were homeless, had gone through these kinds of things because these people look just like them. Just like them. So that's the community change. That's the power of art. That's what can happen on all different levels. It can be like that with a program in a social service agency. It can be like that in a program in a neighborhood. It can be like that in a school. This is what we can do. This is how art can work. And I think it's what we are obligated to do at this point in time. Has anybody been to St. Louis lately? Yeah, good. All right. Yeah, Cherokee Street is the place where lots of artists started moving into because it was cheap and no one cared about it. Um, and, and now it's, it's not so cheap and people care about it. It's also a lot of fun to go to because there's lots of great restaurants. And it was... Um, um, uh, most of the neighbors are black or Latino. We don't have a huge Latino population in St. Louis, but it's where, when people were immigrating, um, went to. So there's great Mexican restaurants. Um, and they're in transition themselves, right? And the artists are trying to figure out what to do there. And um, 
the neighborhood children, so this is a street, right? It's the commercial street, and it's surrounded by houses and apartments. And The neighborhood children in the summertime didn't have anything to do. I'm always amazed at how the schools are closed during the summer. How can you close a school? Um, and so they were wandering the streets, you know, these little kids, because mom and dad were at work. Um, and they would get bored. They're kids, they get bored, they're gonna go outside. And it was, it's hot in St. Louis. If you've been to St. Louis, you know that in the summertime it is humid and it's hot. So they'd go in the bars and they'd say, hey, can we have some water? And the bartenders would give them water, but they'd say, you can't stay in here, it's against the law for you to even be in here, right? So there was a group of artists who I am proud to say are Cat Institute alums who live in that neighborhood. And they said, oh my gosh. And there's this one little kid named DJ, and DJ, he was, he's just a character, right? He's one of those kids, you know, he's a character. He'll talk to anybody, he'll do anything, um, he's funny. Um, and, you know, he, he would start harassing the bartenders. Like, I gotta stay in here, it's too hot out there, you gotta let me stay in here. So Pesha, who is this amazing spoken word poet, um, and Shay Brown, who is an amazing spoken word poet, and Prospect, who's a great DJ, got together and they said, okay, what are we gonna do about DJ, this kid on the, on the street, right? He's our kid, right? Not their kid, but our, you know, he's our kid. What are we gonna do about these kids? So they started an organization called Cherokee Street Reach. And Cher Cherokee Street Reach is probably in its third summer and it's a camp for two weeks. And they have gotten the whole neighborhood involved in this camp. And hopefully someday it'll grow into a whole summer. But this started with the question of what to do about DJ, right? You know this kid, we all know this kid. DJ is, is the star art maker. Um, he's a wonderful spoken word poet. So one of the things that they did was they took an empty parking lot. They found the person who owned it because it wasn't really being used, it was next to his building. And they turned it into a park for these kids, for the kids in the neighborhood. It's concrete, there's a basketball hoop, and there's benches, and it's become a community space and it's called Love Bank Park. So this is how art rises up. This is how art infiltrates. This is how art becomes part of our communities and why it's incredibly important and incredibly powerful. I think we can go to the next one. This is, um, again, St. Louis. Uh, we had 100 days of protest after uh, a policeman, a different policeman that murdered Mike Brown, got off for another murder. This is a guy. Uh, and we and an activist promised to do 100 days of protests, and they did. And this is one of them, and it's a die-in. And I'm showing it because I believe this is art too. Um, this is this is a theater piece. This was organized by um, people who believe in Augusta Boel, people who um, have have been involved in theater and in performance art. So they, they, they created one day, as part of the 100 days of protest, the die-in. All right, I want to try, okay, here we go. We have many tools here. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not gonna keep you too long because I wanna be able to have questions and discuss. So I'm gonna end my, my speaking by reading you something and I hope that's okay with you because this is art too. And it's relating to what I'm talking about, how incredibly powerful it is, because art is a form of communication, and it is our voice, it is how we speak. Um, and it's called Celebration of the Human Voice, and it's by Eduardo Galino, who was a radical journalist who, who turned into a poet. Their hands were tied or handcuffed, their fingers danced, flew, drew words. The prisoners were hooded, but leaning back. They could see a bit, just a bit, down below. Although it was forbidden to speak, 
They spoke with their hands. Pinio Ungerfeld taught me the finger alphabet, which he had learned in prison without a teacher. Some of us had bad handwriting, he said to me. Others were masters of calligraphy. The Uruguayan dictatorship wanted everyone to stand alone, everyone to be no one. In prison and barracks and throughout the country, communication was a crime. Some prisoners spent more than 10 years buried in solidarity, solitary cells the size of coffins, hearing nothing but clanging bars or footsteps in the corridors. Fernandez, Hudabro, and Mauricio Rosenkopf, thus condemned, survived because they could talk to each other by tapping on the wall. In that way, they were told of their dreams and memories. Falling in and out of love, they discussed, embraced, fought. They shared beliefs and beauties, doubts and guilts, and these questions that have no answer. When it is genuine, when it is born of the need to speak, no one can stop the human voice. When denied a mouth, it speaks with the hands or the eyes or the pores or anything at all. Because every single one of us has something to say to the others, something that deserves to be celebrated or forgiven by others. And I believe that art is part of that, part of that, of that communication, part of what we give e each other, part of what we share, and why it brings us together. Do the last slide. So this is Alice. Alice's mother would bring her to Ferguson. And this is from a series by um, Attilio D'Agostino um, of Faces of the Movement. And I'm ending with Alice because today there were children marching in the street asking us to listen to them, to hear their voices. <laughs>